Okay, I finally got the pen working and I think I'm recording. Uh, my name is Meg Graham, in case you forgot, you probably wish you could. Um, today I'm going to talk to you about muscle and nervous tissue. And basically, um, all um, muscle tissue, we're going to start with muscle tissue, so let's get to that slide. Um, all muscle tissue is designed to function in movement of some sort. You've got different types of muscle tissue that allow different kinds of movements. Um, you have skeletal muscle tissue, which is also called striated muscle. Striated muscle is called that because it's striped. It um, looks striped when you look at it under a microscope. Um, this kind of muscle is attached to the bones of your body and that allows movement like walking or hey or waving your hand or whatever. Um, then you have smooth muscle and smooth muscle um, contains no stripes. That's why it's called smooth. Um, it's found in large hollow organs uh, like your intestines, your stomach, your uterus. It's also found in blood vessels, um, and that allows movement of things through the organ. So it kind of pushes things through the organ. Um, then the final type of muscle is cardiac muscle, and cardiac muscle is only found in the heart. Um, it's striated, so it has a little striped appearance to it, and that's due to the different uh, myofibrils or the protein filaments that are in the muscle tissue. Um, but it is used to pump blood throughout the body. Um, so that when the heart contracts, it pushes blood all over the body. So let's look at each type in a little bit more detail. We'll start with skeletal muscle, and like I said before, it's striped, but it's also made of long, unbranched fibers. So you can look at one fiber, and it's going to be the whole length of a muscle. So if I'm looking at like my biceps muscle that's attached between my shoulder and my elbow, one skeletal muscle fiber or one cell is going to be the entire length from my shoulder to my elbow. Well, that poses a problem for controlling the cell. So you've got a nucleus, let's say, right down here on this end. Well, what's going to control the activity of this end of the cell? So in order to fix that problem, skeletal muscle cells are multinucleated. So they have many nuclei all along the way, the length of that cell, so that they can control things. Um, and again, I said they were striped. Um, that's just due to the myofibrils in certain arrangements, and as those myofibrils contract, or, or as they move together, that's what causes the contraction. And you'll learn more about that when we talk about skeletal muscle. Um, notice the fibers, too, are unbranched. They're just long, straight fibers. All right, the next uh, muscles that we want to look at are cardiac muscles. Cardiac muscles, too, are striped or striated, um, but these are more short and kind of branched fibers. Um, they're not the length of the whole muscle, I mean, because it's only in the heart, so the heart is not that big. Um, but they usually have their stripes, and then they also have one, sometimes two nuclei, but usually only one nuclei or nucleus. Um, but one unique feature of them is that they have these little connections between muscle cells, and these are called intercalated discs. So let me write that up here. And these intercalated discs are a combination of an adherence junction, so it glues the cells together, and they're also communicating junctions. Now, why would it be important to have a communicating junction in the heart? Well, you don't want the heart to be, you know, a little bit here, a little bit there. You want it to have one rapid, smooth, coordinated contraction. And so you need these intercalated discs to hold those cells tightly together and also to transmit the information smoothly and cleanly. Because if your heart doesn't beat right, you die. All right, let's go to <laughs> the next uh, muscle, and that is smooth muscle. Smooth muscle is used to push contents through a tube, whether it's a, an intestine or a blood vessel or something like that, um, any of your hollow organs. Um, just because you eat a greasy hamburger, that doesn't mean it's just going to slide through your system with the grease. You've got to have something propelling it through, um, and that's when smooth muscle comes into play. Um, Think about a tube of toothpaste. If you squeeze the tube of toothpaste, something's going to squirt out. Well, that's what smooth muscle does. It surrounds these organs, and as it contracts, it squeezes, and it just kind of propels things through the organs. Um, these cells are kind of spindle-shaped. They're not long. They have one nucleus, and they all kind of sit on top of each other, or they're, they're kind of interconnected with each other, so they form like a sheet of muscles. Um, and again, they all have just one nucleus. Um, 
but the cells overlap, and that overlapping allows the cells to work together to squeeze things through. Um, you'll get a whole lot more muscle when we get to that part of the unit, so let's just move on to nervous tissue. Um, nervous tissue comes in all shapes and sizes, and the whole function of nervous tissue is to regulate and coordinate the activities of the body. Um, Shown here in this picture, this is a neuron, and it's, it's shown here in cartoon fashion, but then this is it right here, um, an actual slide of a neuron. Notice it has lots of processes. These processes allow for input and output to this main cell. The neuron is the main functional unit of the nervous system. I cannot write today. I can't talk either. So I'll quit trying to write and I'll just talk and hopefully you can catch it. Um, it accepts uh, input and it sends out directions for other cells. Uh, for example, if I go and I touch a hot stove, a neuron is going to receive the information that this stove is hot. And then it's going to go up to my spinal cord and I'm going to have a reflex activity where another neuron is going to send a signal out and go, say, contract those muscles, get your hand off the stove. So the neurons are there to receive input and to send signals out and tell us how to uh, live our daily lives. You also have what we call neuroglia, that's a G, that's an E, you can look it up in the book if you can't read my writing. Um, just call those support cells, that'll be easier, okay? So the neuroglia are the support cells of the nervous system. Um, in this picture, you see some right here, these little dots, those are neuro neuroglia cells. Um, and they come in a bunch of different shapes and sizes as well. Um, some of them act as anchors where they will actually hold things in place. Uh, some of them act as barriers. You have some cells that actually form barriers or protective fences. Like in the blood, uh, brain, you have what's called the blood-brain barrier, and that's going to be formed by some of these uh, support cells. Um, some of them secrete an insulating material called myelin. Um, myelin is, we'll learn a whole lot about that, but you have to have some cells to secrete that. You, and so some of those uh, special neuroglia cells will secrete the myelin. Then you have what we call special receptors, and that could be things like taste buds. Uh, you have pressure receptors, like if if something's pushing on me, I can feel it. You have light touch receptors, and you'll learn all about the different receptors. You have pain receptors, um, different kinds of things. But there's lots of just different nervous tissue. But remember that the neuron is going to be your main functional cell of the nervous system. Um, and we'll talk more about that later. But for now, that's all. We'll uh, see you soon. Bye.